Welcome everyone. We're going to be starting in just a minute. Okay, Corey, I think you can start speaking. Okay. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Happy Wednesday. Hope everyone is safe and healthy. Thank you all for joining me for this week's virtual pre-stated press conference. Again, I hope everyone is staying healthy and I hope that your families are safe. I am particularly proud of today's legislative agenda because we're voting on five bills to help small businesses survive in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis. Small businesses and restaurants are the heart and soul of our city and they were struggling before COVID-19 hit and it's been catastrophic for them during this shutdown. I knew we had to act or we would lose many of the shops and restaurants that make our city so special for those of us who live here, but also for those of the people that visit New York City. Now is not the time to charge small businesses high fees or threaten to take away their homes if they can't make their rent. Our restaurants and small businesses are barely surviving and the council is doing what we can to protect them. They need help, not harassment. These bills will benefit our restaurants and all kinds of business owners and our city will be better off because of these bills. So on today's stated agenda, uh, the council will be voting on some crucial pieces of legislation that will help those who need this help during the pandemic. The first two bills are consumer affairs bills. At the moment, the requirement to renew certain licenses and permits required for a business to operate has been suspended pursuant to uh, the executive order. Uh, the bill today, which is sponsored by Minority Leader Matteo and Councilmember Yeager, would require city agencies to publish a list of licenses, permits, and consents or registrations that are not covered by the renewal extension. And new renewal deadlines for any license or permit cannot be earlier than 45 days after the suspension ends. The next bill, number 1916, sponsored by council member Andrew Cohen, would require the city to waive and refund all revocable consent fees for unenclosed sidewalk cafes that are due between March 1st, 2020 and February 28th, 2021. Revocable consent fees for enclosed sidewalk cafes would be waived for the duration of the mayor's emergency executive order, number 105, which was published on April 4th of 2020. Next, the council will be voting on proposed introduction 1936A, sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres and myself. This bill would expand the definition of harassment to include threats against an individual based on their status as a COVID-19 impacted person, their status as an essential employee, or their receipt of a rental concession or forbearance. Violations would be punishable by a civil penalty of $2,000 to $10,000. It's imperative that we step up to ensure that tenants are not harassed or forced out of their homes uh, during this crisis. The following two bills are an effort uh, to alleviate some of the burdens that restaurants are facing now that so many of them have had to switch to takeout and delivery only. Proposed uh, introduction number 1898A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Joni, would prohibit third-party delivery platforms for charging for telephone orders in which a transaction does not take place. Violations of the prohibition, prohibitions in this bill would be subject to civil penalties of up to $500 per day per restaurant that unlawfully makes a charge. And the next bill, proposed introduction number 1908B, sponsored by Councilmember Francisco Moya, would restrict the fees that third-party food delivery services may charge restaurants during states of emergency when restaurants are prohibited from offering food for consumption on premises. Delivery services would be prohibited from charging more than 15% per order for providing delivery services to a restaurant and separately more than 5% per order for all other charges. Violations of the prohibitions in this bill would be subject to civil penalties of up to $1,000 per restaurant per day. 
Both of these bills will be in effect for 90 days following the conclusion of the state of emergency order. And lastly, I worked on the following two bills uh, closely with two colleagues who I'll mention in a moment in an effort to ensure that our small business owners are not facing financial ruin during this crisis. That is something that so many small business owners have been telling us that they're afraid of right now. We need New York to come back stronger than ever and these small businesses make us strong. The first is proposed introduction number 1932A sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera and myself. And that would suspend the personal liability provisions in leases for businesses that were impacted by the mandated closures and service limitations in the governor's executive orders. These are establishments like bars, restaurants, and retail shops. And finally, we are providing protections against the harassment of these tenants that I just mentioned uh, during the pandemic. And proposed introduction number 1914A, sponsored by Councilmember Adrian Adams and myself, would make threatening a commercial tenant based on their status as a COVID-19 impacted business or person, a form of harassment punishable by a civil penalty of $10,000 to $50,000. So uh, first I'll take on topic questions. I'd like to know uh, like the last pre-stated press conference that we had virtually like this a few weeks ago, we have to end just before 1.30 so that uh, we can be on time for the stated meeting today but I'll try to take as many questions as possible. If we don't get to you, we're happy to uh, follow up. You can reach out to the press office. You can speak to Jen, my communications director, and she's gonna call on reporters today. So Jen, do we wanna start off? With yes. They have uh, on topic questions. Yes, anyone have on topic? Shant Sharigian has his hand up. Hi Shant. Hi, Jen. Hi, Mr. Speaker. How are you? Uh, good to hear you. Um, I don't know if this qualifies as on topic. I don't know how that's supposed to work today. Can I just shoot and then... Do you have any, do you have any questions on the bills that we're voting on? I mean, not really, because I've already written about a lot of them. Um, I was wondering... Let's just, Sean, let's just see if there's anyone who has any questions on the bills. And if not, we'll just come back to you first for off topic. Fair enough. Is there anyone who has any questions um, on, on these bills? Heron Yin, do you have an on-topic question? Uh, my question is about the free meals programs. Is uh, related to the restaurants? Okay. Which uh, Heron? I'm sorry. Which which programs? Uh, free meals. Free you know, meals. Uh, yeah, free meals. The city is providing the free meals to the public. Oh, so shall I uh, just go 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 ahead? No, that, that we're just going to take questions on these bills first. Okay. If anyone sure. has them, so any reporters so, that have questions on these bills, if not, we can go to off topic. There's a lot of hands up, so I would just ask you if you don't have an on topic question, if you could just take your hand down, and then uh, we'll go, we'll open up off topic quickly. So we'll, next, we'll go to Jeff Colton. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Unmute myself. Okay, you should be able to hear me now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, just, I was interested in the 90-day uh, the provision um, ex uh, about the, uh, the delivery apps and, and the orders. That it's, so 90 days beyond the conclusion of, of the state of emergency, it seemed. I mean, can you just explain, you know, why extending that beyond the emergency and uh, why 90 days was, was chosen there? Sure, I'll start, but I'll, I'll ask uh, Jeff Baker or Kelly Taylor, who are on uh, this call as well, to weigh in. We think that there's going to be some time that's needed once we start to slowly reopen and we do it in a thoughtful, strategic way. We think there's going to be time that these small businesses are going to need to actually kind of dig out of this hole that they're in. And so just on that first day, once people start to be able to go into some of these businesses again, we don't expect them to be able to be fully operational in the way that they would before. Some of that may have to do with uh, consumers still maybe not feeling comfortable 
coming into these establishments in the way they did pre-COVID-19. And so the 90 days gives a window to continue to allow these restaurants and small businesses to still be able to balance the need of having to do a certain percentage of their business uh, through takeout and through delivery and us knowing that it's not gonna flip immediately back to what it was before. So that's the idea around this. And again, I think we're gonna have to be uh, flexible and in communication with these business owners and with the industry groups that represent them to understand how things are operating on the ground once, once things do start to change and we do start to come out of this. And that will inform um, how we make these decisions. But we thought that a 90 day period would be a good amount of time to make some of those adjustments. Uh, Kelly, Jeff, is there anything that I missed there more technically that relates to why we chose 90 days, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I think that's accurate. I, the only thing I would add is that it is not tied to the emergency order itself. It's tied to the restriction on dine-in service. So when that restriction is lifted, it's 90 days after that. So there could be other social distancing that still applies, um, which means they may not be able to be operating at 100% capacity for a while. So that 90 days is to give them uh, some additional cushion in order to start getting back on their feet. Yeah, any follow-up, Jeff? Could you hear me? Uh, yeah, we heard you. We heard you, Jeff Baker. Any follow-up, Jeff Colton? Sounds sounds good to me. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, the next one is Gloria Pasmina of New York One. Hi, guys. Um, thanks. I wanted to ask just about um it sounds like Grubhub is challenging uh the legality of uh the proposal and uh, saying that they plan to uh, take it to court. So just wondering if uh, that has been uh, gone over and just your reaction to them uh, saying they'll, they'll challenge it. I don't have any information on that, um, on specifically what grounds they're saying we don't have the legal authority to do this. We do believe we have the legal authority. Uh, we had um, hearings on this and we've actually, the council has been talking about this predating the COVID-19 pandemic. There was a hearing on this. I believe uh, Jeff uh, Baker, jump in if I'm wrong. I believe we had a hearing on this last year, actually. So we've spent a lot of time looking at these issues. So I feel like we're on solid legal grounds um, and I'm not concerned about this challenge. I mean, you hear from these restaurants. We had a press conference earlier today, this morning, with uh, Melba, who owns Melba's uh, up in Harlem, and with Gabriel, uh, who owns a bunch of restaurants in my district, almost, uh, almost 10 restaurants in the West Village. And they were saying that these Grubhub uh, fees, these third-party fees, are really decimating them even more. They were hurting them before COVID-19 hit, but in the midst of this, it's making it all that more difficult to even keep some employees employed to do the takeout work. So we feel like this bill is a good balance. Councilmember Moya and Councilmember Joe and I have worked on this for a very long time. And I feel perfectly comfortable where we are as it relates to our uh, legislative purview to be able to enact these things. I think it would be a really bad look for these third party platforms to uh, bring a lawsuit forward when so many of these small businesses are struggling right now and these third party platforms are doing exponentially well, maybe better than ever in the midst of this pandemic, it would you know, be a really bad look for them to be doing this when so many businesses are just trying to uh, keep their heads above water. Gloria, do you have a follow up? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Gloria. Okay, um, the next one is Sydney Pereira of Gothamist. Um, hi, Speaker. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Sydney. Hi. Um, yeah. I this is I have an on off topic as well, but I'll start on topic as as you all said. Um, I wanted to ask. This is this is related to the sidewalk cafe fees, uh, and I know that it's also been talked about. Um, the administration kind of indicated they're looking into like how, you know 
these sidewalks and streets could also possibly be um, open to restaurants to, for customers to spill out into the streets and sidewalks. And I'm wondering, like, as it relates to waiving the sidewalk fees, like, what, what, what's your perspective on that? And, and what would that look like um, to you, how, if you have a perspective on that? Sydney, you're, you're asking what's my perspective on potentially using more sidewalk space and street space for restaurants? For outdoor eating, yeah. 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 I, I, think, I think that's a good idea. I mean, it needs to, of course, be done in a way that is not going to make it difficult for uh, pedestrians to be able to pass in a safe manner. Some sidewalks in the city are much narrower than other sidewalks, uh, but I do think we need to get creative. Um, and of course there can't be a one size fits all solution here, but there are places in the city where you could do something along these lines uh, where if restaurants are not gonna be able to have the, and we don't expect them to be able to have the same indoor capacity that they had pre COVID-19, what are some other options to make it safe for people to dine once we do, once we are able to go in that direction, which I'm not sure is any time in the immediate future, uh, but hopefully we'll get to that point. What are some safe options? And outdoor we know is safer than indoor. So we need to be creative through the Department of Transportation, through the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, through the other city agencies that have regulatory authority on restaurants, on these licenses, on city sidewalks and streets to come together in a collaborative way to look at uh, areas where this could be done effectively. And we should probably, I mean, I think the city should probably set up some type of uh, portal or working group, an interagency working group that um, small businesses could come to uh, showing what the exact conditions are of their restaurant, the capacity of their restaurant, what the outdoor conditions look like uh, outside of their restaurant or cafe or small business, and would that be something that would work? That's gonna require these city agencies to be nimble, to be able to work with the small businesses that have been affected and figure out how to get this done for them depending on the size of the sidewalk or what's going on on the street outside. I mean, you're not gonna be able to do this in every place, but there may be places where you can do this and we should be looking to how to work with these small businesses effectively and nimbly to help them as they start to try to recover. Again, I don't think that's happening in the next uh, few weeks or potentially even in the next month, uh, but as we look to make that happen, these are the things that need to be prepped and ready so that these businesses have the ability to do some of these things in the outside the box way, which will help them recover. Sydney, do you have a follow up? Um, I don't, my, my other questions are off topic, so. Okay, we'll come back to you for off topic. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I don't see any more hands up, so we're gonna go to off topic and we'll start with Shant and then we'll go to Haran. Okay, so we'll go to Shant. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about this really shocking statistic that nine out of 10 of coronavirus related arrests have been of black and Latino New Yorkers. What steps would you urge the mayor and uh, Commissioner Shea to take to ameliorate that? And on a sort of related note, um, do you support Donovan Richards call for the NYP to cancel this year's police academy class? Thank you. Thanks, Sean. So you know, the, the numbers are, um, you know, I, I shouldn't say they're shocking because they're not shocking in some ways in a city that has seen the over-policing of communities of color for many years. Uh, so, I mean, the numbers are appalling, I think, that uh, these number of summonses and arrests have been so disproportionately affecting communities of color and it's important that we be honest about that, that we talk about what that means. And the council a few weeks ago uh, called for transparency around this before those numbers were released. We wanna know where uh, officers are being uh, mobilized to, uh, what zip codes those are in. Uh, the, we, wanted, we, we called for 
uh, making the data public around the uh, race and ethnicity uh, of individuals that were being arrested or issued summonses. You saw uh, some of these videos that came out. They were uh, totally uh, unacceptable on the interaction that was taking place between law enforcement and individuals. So, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that and not gloss over that in any way, given the um, profound division that was caused in our city uh, during stop, question, and frisk, and what we see as the over-policing of uh, black and brown communities. I think it's important to say that and to be honest about that. On the question of the uh, NYPD uh, class, we're gonna go through the budget process. I, you know, I'm not gonna do between now and when we adopt the budget, sort of just one-offs on this item versus this item versus this item. You know, I do think that uh, it is hard to square a proposed 40% cut for the Department of Youth and Community Development budget but less than a 1% cut for the NYPD. I mean, I think those numbers, you know, are incongruent in so many ways. And the council, as we move through the budget process, will be looking at this. Uh, the budget picture is a moving target, given that we're waiting to see what type of federal help comes in this next stimulus bill, how long things are gonna be shut down for, what the cuts will look like, at the state level uh, where the governor has the ability to uh, make cuts to localities. All of those things are outstanding questions and that's gonna inform the entire budget process. So we will go through the hearings as you've seen this week and last week. And then we will go into uh, presenting our executive budget response and then we'll go into the negotiation and adoption process. So I think everything needs to be on the table, um, but uh, I don't want to go into one-offs here because we could do that on a million items. Thanks, Shant. Um, okay, next up, Harin Yen, please. Hi, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Hi, thanks Harin. for having back. Uh, sure. I hope you and your loved one are doing well. Thank you. It's very sweet of you. I hope you too. Uh, thank you. So uh, during the COVID-19 public health crisis, there are food pantries and grab-and-go meals, as well as the delivery emergency meals to the people in need all running by the city. But according to the COVID-19 food czar, uh, Catherine Garcia, most of the food providers for the programs I just mentioned are cooperation kitchens as to produce the meals in large scale, as well as to meet the safety and the nutritional standards. My question, uh, my first question is, the free food programs is a big pie. Do you think it's possible that the city to outsource the contracts to the local restaurants to produce the free meals? Um, the second question is, the city has responded to the request for the kosher meals, but there are still some ethnic groups are left behind. For example, as of today, the city free meal program and not included Chinese or Asian food designed for the Chinese and Asians for now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Heron. So on the second question, I'm proud that, um, you know, almost two years ago, the council pushed for uh, kosher and halal meals uh, in the schools and we got a pilot program to provide kosher and halal meals. And I think it's really important in the midst of this um, pandemic and this emergency that we're in, that all communities have uh, culturally sensitive and appropriate uh, food options that are available to them. Uh, that's both kosher and halal, but as you mentioned, Heron, also uh, food that's appropriate uh, for the Chinese community or other communities that are out there that are seeking these type of food. So I think, I mean, this ties into your first question, if the city doesn't have right now uh, on contract, the ability to get those type of meals that these communities need, that many of these seniors need, that families rely upon who have been hard hit by this, I think we should be looking to work with restaurants who are struggling right now, uh, finding ways to figure out if they could produce a certain number of meals on a daily and weekly basis for some of these 
communities that wouldn't typically be served by some of these larger contracted providers, it could be a double win in some ways. You would be getting the food that communities want and you could be supporting local small businesses and restaurants who are suffering right now and who want the ability to open up or to build on some of the takeout and delivery business they're doing and to help New Yorkers. So I do think this is something that the city should be looking at uh, in finding ways to get more food options out there and help support local small businesses. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next we have Joe Anuda from Politico. Hi, Mr. Speaker, how are you? Hi, Joe, how are you doing? Not too bad. Um, I had a question for you. We, we had a story this morning, uh, some like housing groups like uh, New York Housing Conference analyzed, uh, I guess there's a, about a billion dollars that came to New York from the CARES Act in the form of community development block grants and that mm -hmm. flows through HUD. Mm -hmm. And they found that, uh, you know, New York has about 25% of the COVID cases nationally, uh, but only got about 7% of the funding. So the point is we're getting way less than Florida and some other states. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the specific line of funding, but if so, could you talk about your reaction to that or just in general uh, about how federal funding uh, has arrived in New York and sort of uh, in proportion to other states around the country? Sure, thanks Joe. Um, I saw a good piece uh, last night in Gotham Gazette uh, looking at the amount of uh, federal money that's come in so far under the previous uh, bills through an IBO report, an independent budget office report that detailed all of the money as it related to some of the budget lines you just mentioned, Joe, HUD money related to community development block grants, also public health money and small business money. And what we have seen uh, from the beginning of this crisis is the uh, typical formula that has been used in the past um, has really been more advantageous for smaller states that have not had the same uh, COVID-19 uh, mortality or infection rate that we've had. I mean, if you look at the number, I'm forgetting it uh, right now, but I think if you look at the number that was given a few weeks ago on what Nebraska was getting uh, in the CARES bill versus what New York is getting, you know, we were getting sort of $17,000, I think the number was, uh, per case and Nebraska was getting millions of dollars per case. Uh, so it, it, it shows that this is not being done on a real need basis. And I know that members of our congressional delegation have been working really hard to change that. They've been pushing to make sure that we get more money. And I think you saw in this uh, newly released bill that I believe came out yesterday uh, from the House of Representatives, that New York would do quite well uh, from a formula perspective under that bill. My hope is that eventually when uh, Mitch McConnell decides to move on this, that uh, we will be able to get a fair formula uh, as the House bill proposes. But clearly through these previous formulas that have been used, we haven't gotten the amount of money on a need basis compared to what other cities and localities and states have received. And we're the epicenter of COVID-19 in the United States of America. And our economy is inextricably linked to how well the nation does. Over the last four years, New York City has given $100 billion more to the federal government than we've gotten in return. We are a, a sort of a giver state to the feds. And, uh, and that should be recognized uh, because us getting up and going again and getting our economy moving again and keeping people uh, employed, that will eventually help other places around the country given how much money we give to the federal government every single year. So I am deeply concerned about it. And I'm hopeful that in this HEROES bill that was unveiled yesterday, that we will see an improvement on the previous formulas that have been used. Do you have any follow-ups, Joe? Uh, no, that'll do it for me, thank you. Yep, thanks. 
Thanks, Joe. Okay, next we have Reuven Fenton, New York Post. Hi, Speaker, how are you doing? Hi. Hi, um, if you could address, a uh, uh, weigh in on a story we had in the Post um, yesterday, essentially, uh, you know, the mayor is very vocally threatened to, uh, you know, he, he may have to lay off or furlough frontline workers because of the budget, but uh, we, uh, we had in the Post that uh, he, he made two, nearly $2 million worth of hirings or promotions of at least 10 people uh, in the last several weeks, including uh, several communications jobs and a records director position. So I'd love if you could uh, share your, your opinion, your thoughts on the, on the matter. I don't know much besides what I read in the story, but I do know that Councilmember Holden uh, asked questions at our budget hearing last week related to this very question where he uh, said, have there been any hires um, that you've called for a hiring freeze. And the answer from, I believe OMB was that there wasn't any hires. So this story, I believe details uh, the number of hires that have happened. The mayor's office is saying that this, these hires are related to uh, COVID-19 response. I don't know if that's correct or not. $2 million does seem like a lot of money in the midst of this crisis that we're in. There are gonna be some potential needs that come up uh, related to COVID-19, where people may have to be hired. I can't speak individually to these hires, though, to know whether or not it actually is related to COVID-19 or if it's not. But I think it's a fair question to ask, uh, given uh, the, the severe uh, economic crisis that we're in and the budget picture that's in front of us as we seek to adopt the budget over the next seven weeks before the end of June. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Be safe. Okay, um, next we have Sydney Pereira again from Gothamist, then Gloria. Thanks for giving me a second question. I appreciate it. Uh, sure. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, just given some of the unknowns of what the federal government's going to uh, provide city and state governments, and just the financial situation. Is there any um, revenue raising possibilities the council could have the authority to do or implement without state authority? Or do you have any other types of creative solutions that are being looked into at all regarding that? I mean, not really. I mean, just generally, even outside of this crisis, the um, you know local taxing authority under the state constitution isn't provided to localities uh, for the most part. So we have no say over the personal income tax or over the sales tax or over any of these taxes where Albany has authority. Uh, we do have some say, though not total discretion over the property taxes, but now is not the time to raise property taxes. We're in the midst of people being uh, really hurt. So that's not I think the appropriate way to raise revenue right now. Uh, I do think that it's something that needs to be on the table that we should be asking uh, the folks that are doing quite well uh, to pitch in and to help the rest of New York City in a moment of deep crisis and need. And so, uh, I mean, I think that Trump tax bill a few years ago was a giveaway to corporations and to the ultra wealthy after the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009, there was a tax increase that was put in uh, at the state level for uh, some of the highest earners in the state to help the state in that moment. So I think we need to look at these things, but I don't think that's likely happening over the next six to eight weeks as we have to adopt this budget for the next fiscal year. And so what we really need is we need those revenue replacement dollars in this next stimulus bill from Washington to be able to pay for not just the COVID-19 related costs, which have been enormous over the last nine weeks, but to make up for all of the lost income tax revenue and sales tax revenue uh, and other revenue that the city was expecting that has put us in this very precarious budget situation. So I do think we should have the conversation uh, and I would be supportive of trying to find ways to raise additional revenue. Uh, but 
Uh, I don't think that's happening in the next six weeks before we adopt this budget. So what we really need is that money coming from Washington and we're gonna need to uh, look to find more savings uh, in the budget. And there are gonna be some painful decisions that we're gonna have to make uh, given the reality of where we are right now. So it's gonna be a combination of continuing to find additional savings using some of our reserves that are there, maybe not as much has been proposed in the uh, executive budget, they're proposing using a pretty significant amount uh, and relying on some of the federal money to come in. It's gonna be a combination of those things to deal with the budget hole that we're projecting in the current fiscal year and in the next fiscal year. Okay, thank you, Sydney. Else, Sydney? Yeah, uh, do you have a, um, how, many, how much of the reserves do you think we should be using if not what the executive budget proposes? It's all it, it's all sort of a jigsaw puzzle. It all fits together. So I can't really say that in a vacuum. It depends on how much federal money comes in, what other savings can we find? Um, and those two questions then will build into the amount of reserves we should use. I believe, um, and, and forgive me, because I have so many numbers uh, just running around in my head, but I believe the proposed amount was $4 billion to use uh, in this upcoming budget. I don't know if that's the appropriate number. That might be too much, honestly, because it doesn't leave us with, with, with much of a cushion for next year's budget, the fiscal 2022 budget, where we know there are out year deficits that are projected given the recession that we're in and potentially a depression that we could be in. So, you know, we need to be doing budget planning that doesn't just look at the current moment that we're in, but also plans for the next couple of years as well. And the way you do that is by figuring out how to best use those reserves appropriately given the time horizon that we're looking at. So I can't say exactly what that number would be, but we need to figure out on those other factors on finding additional savings over the next uh, eight weeks and making some cuts, uh, as well as the amount of federal money comes in, that's what will inform the reserve number. Thank you, Sydney. Okay, um, Gloria has put her hand down. So I will go next to Shant if he has a second question. There's a bunch of hands that are up of people who ask questions, which is fine. I just wanna make sure that you don't have your hand up still. If take it down if, you, if your question's been answered. If you have a second question, leave it up, thanks. I think that was a technical thing on my end. Sorry about that. I, I'm good to go. Okay, thanks. Okay, does anyone have a question right now? Everybody's hand is down except for Shant, and now Shant is down. Um, if everyone's good, then we're good. We can get started. It's stated, which is at 1.30. We're passing a bunch of, we're voting on a bunch of bills. Um, okay, I think everyone's good. Thank you all yeah. for coming. Thank you all. Be safe.